Okay, here we go. So we are going to talk about cash again. Um, so um, it's pretty independent from a uh, previous one we've, uh, we've had, um, in the sense that we, our scope is more on the browser slash proxy side, um, slash uh, CDN, but uh, with a specific approach that is um, the uh, ETAG mechanism. Um, so it's not um, time-based and uh, it's a different approach that suits uh, the suit, like the needs that I had at the moment. Uh, definitely not for everyone, but uh, I'll show you the, the pros and cons for it. Um, so th the idea of the ETAG mechanism is um, some, something that saved my ass quite a, a couple of times. Um, for performance, it's pretty easy. Um, when you reply to HTTP query, you say the tag of this query is uh, whatever, a random string, you decide. And then when the server asks for the same, uh, when the browser asks for the same re resource again, uh, they say, okay, tell me if it has changed since uh, last e tag. And uh, you say yes or no. And if no, you just say it didn't change. And the browser is like, oh, fine, okay, I'll just display the one I had before. So there's a request to the server, uh, but you don't need to generate the, the answer if the answer has not uh, changed. And that's a great way to put the burden of caching on the client and not on the backend. Like you don't need a Redis or whatever to, to cache stuff. Uh, support for um, e-tags is great in browsers, great in Django, terrible in uh, proxies, because it's actually very hard for proxies. Um, like imagine in the scenario, the proxy has the thing in cache, so there's a new client that doesn't have the thing in cache that asks the proxy, give me uh, this page, the proxy needs to, because the proxy proxies, right, so it's going to relay the headers coming from um, the client. So if the client did not put the if not match header in um, the request, then it needs to go get the if not match header that it has somewhere else, get a 304 from the server, and then reply with a 200 and the tag to the client. Uh, if you did not understand, it doesn't matter. It's just to illustrate the point. It's, it's pretty confusing. And you see here the, um, the truth table uh, that you need to implement, and that's a simplified, a simplified one, right, at the um, proxy uh, level. So, and then I tried many, many, many different options uh, that didn't work out at all. Um, so Nginx is a uh, complicated, I mean, Nginx is, I'm sure you can make it work with Nginx one way or the other, but I just f did not find it. Uh, Squid just ignores the thing altogether. Uh, Varnish uh, almost does it, but uh, not exactly. Cloudflare ignores uh, the tag, even though they say they support it. Um, Apache HTTPD um, does not. I tried also, um, you know, all the caddy traffic, uh, all this, well, it didn't work out. In the end, I, I, like Apache Traffic Server, it's, uh, you, you go to the website, it looks horrible, um, and then you're like, oh my god, this, this thing must you know, date from a uh, paleolithic era or something like this, and it's, um, it's not going to be nice, but actually it was uh, supporting the thing natively and uh, very easily, and uh, so I'm, I'm very glad it pushed me to discover this thing, uh, but more on that later. So um, it used to be a commercial, so basically what happened with uh, this uh, traffic server, it used to be commercial software, um, made by a company that got acquired by Yahoo for something entirely different, and they did not know what to do with it, so they just said, well, let's open source it, that's it. Uh, so it got open source, given to the Apache Foundation, um, and it's um, out of all the things I've listed, except for Vanish, I think it's uh, the only one that is intended to be a reverse proxy, that is made for this use case, because all of them, it's uh, HTTP servers that ac accidentally do reverse proxying. And um, it has auto-compression of uh, content with simple plugins like uh, GZ, Broadly, WebP, and so on. Um, and also different use cases like uh, you can authenticate against S3 bucket and have public and sign in URLs and stuff like this. So really great piece of software, but uh, let's go on the tags. Um, so we are basically um, having two things that is expiring things with e tags or expiring things with um, the time, right? So the tag, you still need a round trip to the server, so like the latency is maybe not going to be great. So of course, um, if you go through a CDN, uh, you will do the round trip to the CDN, and the CDN has a keep alive connection to your backend, so there's not so much handshaking happening, but still you, you need to reach 
the server. Um, the, in the tag, the real uh, the content expires in real time. Like if you change the value of the tag, um, it's expired automatically. So um, that's that's really convenient if you don't want to. I mean, if you want immediate uh, you know eradication of uh, cache. Um, if it's time based, you need to call an API or wait for the, the amount of time. And uh, which is, uh, in my opinion, like, for example, I have um, the website for which I, I did this has a lot of content, um, expires pretty, like, that is edited pretty rarely. But if I edit it, I want it to change quickly. So I don't want to put a one week uh, expiration on the pages when uh, really I want them to, to expire automatically. Uh, the attack is conceptually simple, uh, not for the proxies, but uh, for the, you know, the browser, it's simple. Um, but um, for the time-based expression, you need to call APIs and deal with vendor-specific uh, specificities to you know, expire the stuff. The e-tag is fast enough. Uh, I had two, two second generation uh, for my pages, and now it's about 100 milliseconds. Uh, so that's uh, good enough. That's not the best. The time-based will, you know, no need to run trip to the server. So it's going to be immediate. The e-tag is going to be longer. Um, the e-tag also works for the browser. So if the browser, I mean, the browser will also cache the different pages. So depending on your use case, that can be interesting because you cannot uh, expire remotely. There's no API for the browser to expire the stuff, right? So um, having the e-tag in the browser to validate the content, it can be pretty interesting. So it's really um, a question of how do you want to expire your content and what is the performance trade-off you want to be doing. Um, and in my case, it's definitely um, uh, e tag that was interesting. Um, so how do I implement uh, this? So basically, I'm going to show you uh, snippets of code that are integrated with a model W that I uh, talked about earlier. But uh, you can, like, it's the concept you can uh, re-adapt uh, in any way you want. It's just like the different uh, things to consider I'm going to list. So. On the Django side, um, what we decided to do is have one e-tag for the whole website. You do any edit in the website, and it expires everything, because then you don't have to. Because otherwise, you know, you change the title of a page, then you need to change it in the menu everywhere, or you change something. You know, it can be a read more section and so on. So th there's a lot of things that can, ha you know, there's lots of re possible repercussions. So since I don't edit the website that often, uh, I prefer just to expire everything when there's an edit made and uh, let the cache rebuild itself. Um, so just needed to hook up to, to Wagtail uh, to clear the cache. And the clear cache is just, uh, so I'm using basically the Django caching framework just to store the e-tag value, um, and then that's it. Uh, how do you generate this e-tag? Okay, so the e-tag is anything you want. It's any string you want. Uh, so you just generate a random enough string, and that's it. One thing that is important, however, is to also expire the e-tag when you rebuild your um, website. Because if you change your source code, and the design has changed or whatever, you don't want to be uh, serving an old uh, version of your source code. So it's not just the content, it's also what the page looks like. And that's uh, pretty easy with CICD to put uh, you know, the build ID as an environment variable. So that's what we do. We have the build ID as an environment variable and we, we store it there. So this key function allows, uh, allows us to store the e tag in the Redis and then we get this key. And so basically if we change the build prefix, we are going to generate automatically a new e tag. And the generation of the tag itself is uh, just a random string of, uh, I don't know, 50 characters length or something like this. Just one detail here, you see the W slash in front of the e tag, which means it's a weak e tag, meaning that you can apply content transformations on uh, the content, uh, and you'll see later why it's uh, helpful. Um, so then you need to inject this e tag into every page. And in the context of Wagtail today, it's a bit uh, artisanal, right? You, you, uh, you do it as you want. So what we decided to do is that we can have, have uh, one model that is um, parent uh, in terms of class of all the other class page, uh, pass, uh, page classes, uh, in which we added two different uh, attributes that is use e tag, yes or no, 
and cache control headers, uh, where we set literally the content of the cache control headers, uh, and it's in the, we put it in the promote section in the, in the pages. Um, so then we have a decorator that we use to decorate the self method uh, that like is conflicting a bit with a rotable uh, page mixing, so it was a bit uh, complicated to get it uh, right. But basically, the idea is that we just uh, invoke the um, e tag decorator from Django and wrap the self method with it, and that's it. So this uh, this e tag this um, e tag decorator basically will. Uh, handle for you the checking if not match, if it matches, then this, and otherwise not, and so on. So it's all provided by Django. It's just some uh, wrapping and uh, plumbing. Uh, then you need to fix the HTTP headers. So I discovered uh, doing this that Django is uh, actually very smart in dealing with uh, HTTP headers because the um, like if you put um, if you use the session for example it will automatically add in the very header so that is the header that uh, tells on which other http header you need to look to know what is your cache key uh, it will add the uh, cookies to the very header if uh, you use the session but otherwise not okay so and that for lots of uh, things the gzip middleware also will uh, add its own stuff and so on so it's pretty interesting and uh, there's just one thing that we need to do from that, that is the, um, how to say, uh, to check if the cookie is indeed in the very headers, and if so, to mark the cache as a private, no matter what, because otherwise it means that we are potentially serving some uh, private content uh, to in, in the cache and caching it forever, so that could be annoying. Um, so my advice is do not enable the JZIP middleware, from Django because uh, if you put uh, traffic server in front, uh, traffic server is much better at doing this than uh, the middleware from Django. Um, and um, yeah, that's it. So, but the main point of this middleware is just to mark the cache as private if needs to, and that just adding up with the other mechanisms of Django. Um, there's another thing that is cache busting um, the the thing. So, if you remember the previous talk, right? There's uh, I say it's a proxy, like if you ask slash foo on the front end, the front end will ask slash foo from the API. But if the front end that runs in the browser asks for a slash foo, um, and that it needs to be the, the answer from the, the back end and not from the front end, uh, not the pre-rendered you know, thing from the front end, then it can be very confusing because it's the same URL and it's completely different resources. Uh, and uh, you could deal with it with a very header, but actually you could not because lots of uh, uh, software d uh, like ignores the very header. So bottom line is, if you ask slash foo from the front end, then it's translated into a slash underscore underscore row underscore underscore slash foo uh, URL, so it's just a prefix. And in order not to trifle with uh, Django roots and the uh, Wagtail routing and so on, I just modify here the path on the request object so that everybody thinks it's just uh, like a request on slash instead of a slash row and that's it. Um, then on the next side, uh, what do we do? So if you remember, the next side is a, is a proxy that is uh, adding JavaScript and CSS. But um, what you need to do when a request comes in, you need to look for the if non match header and put it in your own request to the server. Otherwise, um, the whole mechanism is uh, broken. Same thing, you need to prefix your URLs with a underscore underscore row because otherwise uh, you will not, um, you will have the caching issue I was uh, talking about. Um, and then you need to proxy uh, back, so when the server replies, all the different uh, cache control headers, so the vary, the tag, cache control, and then if the answer is not modified, to reply as well not modified. And uh, basically, Nuxt, um, we create an error because there's a way to, to deal with it in uh, Nuxt to say, okay, three or four, not modified, um, same as if it was 500 or uh, 404 or 301. It's a um, non-200 HTTP code, basically, and we are replying uh, not modified. And the browser accepts it, so it's fine. And we, there's no rendering process happening in uh, next side because we just short, shortcut it uh, like this. Um, then, how do you configure the forward proxy with uh, the cache, right? 
So as I was saying, um, uh, traffic server is very easy to use, but the request.config file is horrible. And when you open the Debian uh, version of this configuration file that has all the options already listed and commented, it's like a, a wall of text, like there's no space, it's just um, you know, suffocating. So um, I created the Docker image of traffic server that is um, making it easier to use. It does two things. The records.yaml, uh, the records.config file, you can fill it up in uh, YAML. That is much more readable than the original uh, syntax. And you can also interpolate environment variables in any configuration file for um, traffic server. So that's, you know, more the Docker way of life. Um, so we have uh, different files. So let's start with um, remap.config, okay? That is... Uh, and what you're going to see here is the full configuration, just so you understand it's very easy to configure. So basically here you map the URLs from uh, what you know, you're going to get as an input and you map it to an origin server. So you say everything that is on slash back goes to my uh, API and everything else goes to my front end. Super straightforward. Uh, here you see um, you know, Django template stuff. It's not really Django template, but uh, inspired syntax. And that is the Docker image that does this. It's not uh, stuck with a traffic server. Um, you have then the records.config file. So I'm not going to explain all the options, but uh, three are pretty important. Uh, first one is to limit the RAM used because um, otherwise you're going to, like if you deploy it on Kubernetes and you did not put any limit on this, it will use all the RAM available for you know all the other containers. So you need to not forget to limit it. Um, of course, I thought of that before pushing it to production. Um, then you have to configure the DNS resolution to be uh, looking for the default uh, domains. Uh, again, if you deploy in Kubernetes, uh, that's how you know the internal URLs of uh, API and front end. So um, by default, it's not looking to that. And then another one that I, I find extremely convenient is the normalize AE, that is uh, normalize accept encoding, because um, the way the vary header works is that you say it varies depending on this header, this header, this header, but it's not semantic inside the header. So if one client says uh, vary gzip, um, says uh, accept encoding and says gzip botly, and the other one says botly gzip, it's two different headers. So you can have an infinite amount almost of um, you know, uh, variations. But since you don't even understand all the encodings possible and so on, it, it doesn't make any sense. So what it does is that it will uh, sort them in a specific order and it will, um, you know, always accept, uh, I mean, remove the ones that it does not understand. So basically when you configure it, you say, okay, um, you, you understand uh, gzip and uh, botly and, uh, and you normalize it this way. And this way, your page will be um, compressed. Well, more on this later. Um, so we are going to use two plugins uh, that are compress and uh, header rewrite, OK? Um, so first one, header rewriting, is just to add some, uh, some stuff. So there's a first thing to say if it's a hit or miss in the cache, and then remo remove the server and uh, ex-powered by uh, headers because uh, it's well known that it's a great security improvement to hide the name of the server. Um, and then we enable test compression, and that's really an amazing uh, part of it, because you get, uh, is basically what Cloud, Cloudflare does, but it's like the open, open source version of uh, Cloudflare. Um, so you say the algorithms that you want to handle, you, want to, you say you want to cache them and uh, generate them, and you say which uh, MIME types you want to compress, and then that's it, and it's, it's blazing fast, it's much faster than the uh, GZIP implementation uh, of Django. It's uh, doing boldly in real time. If you try to do it in Python, it's, uh, it's very, very slow. Um, like, I mean, to give you an example, um, broadly compression on my pages, it was 700 milliseconds when I tried to do in, uh, in Python side, but uh, there it's, uh, you know, insignificant. So it's uh, very good at doing this, and uh, I highly recommend uh, using uh, ATS also for that. Um, so as a conclusion, um, th this is based on model W that I presented earlier, but even if you're not using it, obviously you can uh, inspire yourself from the different checkpoints. So like really each, each slide is a requirement that you need to follow if you want to implement it yourself. 
Um, the tag is very convenient, at least for some use cases like mine. Um, and uh, it's especially convenient if you want to expire pages immediately from and the browser and the CDN. Um, of course, it has some drawbacks. And I'm also very surprised uh, in this process to have discovered the uh, traffic server that is um, actually a great piece of, uh, of software and very easy to use despite um, some uh, looks that are a bit uh, uh, frightening. And that will be it for this presentation. Thank you.